thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm CCP Goliath, QA director of EVE Online, and uh, I've been in the role now for about two and a half years. Today we're going to be talking about whole team quality. Uh, we're going to dive into exactly what that is a little later. First of all, I'm going to talk about some challenges that we face uh, in the QA and in development of EVE Online. First of these challenges is environmental. So TQ is obviously very architecturally complex. And to replicate this architecture in a test environment would be pretty unfeasible um, for the simple reason that if we had another TQ lying around, we'd obviously just want to use it for fights. <laughs> Makes sense. So uh, there's a couple of areas that this impacts. Uh, an obvious one would be server performance. Kind of hard to measure the performance of the server when you don't have the server itself. And uh, database scripts. The timing of execution of database scripts can be very different on Singularity and, and the other test servers uh, than it would be on TQ. But despite these challenges, we do uh, manage to estimate very well and take some logical leaps with server performance and kind of mitigate those, those risks. We also have behavioral challenges. Uh, <laughs> uh, basically, as you can see, there's so many things to do in EVE that you can't really fit them onto one slide in a readable sense. Uh, with that amount of edge cases and odd behaviors and you guys generally being the crazy people that you are, uh, it can be kind of tough to really, I don't know, nail down exactly what players are going to do when a feature hits TQ. Considering all of the behaviors is obviously vital, um, even in the smallest way, uh, because it informs your test planning. And test planning is definitely one of the most important parts of whole team quality. Of course, uh, we also have different ways of being informed rather than just guesswork. We've got forum feedback threads. We've got the CSM. Uh, you know, you guys are a, a vocal bunch. And uh, there's also the, the bad behavior, uh, which you, know, you can't always think positive. And uh, some people just want to watch Jita burn, I guess. <coughs> <laughs> and then uh, we have our third challenge, uh, which is that of legacy. Uh, so game development techniques have advanced a lot in the last 10 years. With a mature code base, shall we say, uh, kind of akin to a house of cards, very often we'll uh, rather than apply a bunch of band-aids to a system or try and like, retrofit it to work with all of the systems it's connected to, it's simpler for us to just basically gut it and refactor it from scratch. Uh, this is no picnic for QA, because most systems in EVE kind of touch in various interconnected, sometimes hidden ways on a lot of other features. And, and estimating exactly what you're touching at any one time can be pretty difficult. A really good example of this is Crime Watch. Uh, we refactored that over two releases, the uh, Escalation to Inferno and Inferno. Um, that was Team 5.0. So the way we approached that was our outsourcing partners, Paul to Win, went through Crime Watch and uh, put together a very robust 41-page PDF of exactly how Crime Watch used to behave. We had that going in, so we were able to use that to inform our test planning and make sure that all of the systems that we were touching remained you know, as they were prior to the refactor. And uh, the, yeah, the team used the document in their planning, and they had a really solid release. And uh, jumping back to the behavior for a moment, this is a really great example of this. The first weekend after they released their refactor crime watch, the inaugural Burn Jita event happened. I think that was uh, probably the best stress test we could ever have hoped for. So, you know, thanks. <clears throat> so that's QA challenges, but we also have challenges in development. Before whole team quality, QA were the perennial bottleneck of development. As you can see, development velocity always exceeded QA bandwidth. So QA would have to put in overtime or face the risk of not being able to check everything as thoroughly as they'd like, that increases the risk of shipping with defects. You might think that a really easy way to mitigate this would just be to hire more QA, but then you replace your overtime problem with that of overhead. Taking in the new staff, training them up, and just widening that communication loop a little bit further is very risky. So the risk still very much remains there. So our approach became pretty clear. Things needed to change. We needed an answer. We needed to put more load on our in-house QA as well, because we scaled back our outsourcing. So the answer we came up with was whole team quality. So here we go. Step one, development would need to be throttled at times when extra testing was needed. Uh, that would have to, by nature, be very flexible. But it couldn't just be reactive, because that would damage development velocity far too much. Step two was giving the teams much more control over their work. So 
for teams to truly have ownership of a feature, they need to be responsible for the quality of that feature. The way we did this was to make them responsible for setting their own quality bar. The product owner of the team uh, was accountable for the output of the team. Stakeholders, such as the senior producer or the CSM, uh, they would uh, be consulted on the features, and then the players yourselves would be informed and oftentimes consulted uh, through forum feedback threads, dev blogs, and of course, the ever valuable tweet fleet. And uh, this required a focus shift for QA. And this slide required a focus shift for myself from QA director to artist. So I hope you appreciate my fine work. I'm sure the, the offers will be flooding in. Um, yeah, we shifted from custodian to strategist. I hope that's immediately obvious. Uh, <laughs> test planning became vitally important at this stage. Estimation of testing tasks, risk assessment before features got like fully into development became the, the highest priorities for QA. One risk area we'd already identified was that communication between teams could be a little bit shaky, uh, and even sometimes within teams. One way that QA decided to mitigate this was basically just by meeting up every two weeks, going over what we're working on at any given time, and uh, yeah, making sure that all of the risk areas and like possible interdependencies got flagged up. But a focus shift isn't just enough. Obviously, we needed to change the duties of QA too. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to take on the extra work along with you know, this new strategic approach. So uh, I'll take questions at the end if you don't mind. Sorry, uh, if I break my train of thought, this whole thing might go off the rails. <laughs> so uh, QA, first and foremost, had to create release-based and sprint-based test plans. Test documentation became the norm, but not normalized. It's very important in whole team quality that everyone is allowed to work in the style that suits them best as far as humanly possible. And then we also had other duties like, you know, regression script delivery, test environment, uh, you know, preparation and, uh, and maintenance, ensuring the risk assessment was carried out early. And of course, QA were able to coach their teammates in the techniques and the methods that they've built up to, uh, to test the game. And so to get into a little bit more of the of the day-to-day -day work of QA, I'm going to bring on CCP Paradox from Team Super Friends. Am I on? Okay, now I am. So, I'm CCP Paradox. Uh, welcome to FanFest. So, I'm going to talk a bit about whole team quality in practice uh, and just how this works out on um, like an Eve development team. So, let's get started. So, I work on Team Super Friends, uh, and there's seven team members, there's seven of us. So, there's one QA, there's four software engineers, and there's two designers. And not all teams have the same uh, makeup uh, in EVE development. Some are larger and some are smaller. And it's mostly about, um, so it's mostly up to the team to choose their kind of direction in EVE development. Uh, they get guidance from uh, people like the senior producer, uh, the lead game designer, uh, and of course the EVE roadmap. Uh, Next up, uh, I'm just going to go through some features so you know, you know who Team Super Friends are. Uh, first off, we did the war declaration changes, uh, the bounty hunting and kill rights, uh, probe scanning changes, and uh, high sec customs offices, and the siphon unit and the encounter uh, surveillance deployables. So, I mean, those are just some of the more larger recognizable features. Uh, we also do other things in between, such as little things for, for Eve, uh, also the bug reporting system. Uh, we also have what we call, you know, 20% time that some of you might have heard about. Uh, it often goes into the Eve product backlog, or it becomes something entirely different, like uh, Eve Valkyrie, for instance. Uh, and of course, in between all this, we we continue to fix uh, defects and bug reports, and you know, do balancing in between. So this is where we fit into EVE developments. Uh, Team Super Friends are just in the uh, gameplay segment here. Uh, and in EVE developments, we work in Agile, uh, in Scrum. I don't know how many of you are software develop, uh, developers. OK, quite a few, I see. Uh, and, and of course, the EVE QA guys in the front. Uh, so teams in uh, EVE development 
often practice uh, different methods of Agile. We have some that run in Kanban, uh, some have different lengths of uh, Scrum. Uh, and all of these teams, though, it's important to remember, they, they have at least one QA embedded in the team. And the QA is you know, regarded as uh, a development member of the team. Uh, and they kind of act as a catalyst for whole team quality. Uh, so when we move to whole team quality, you know, we emphasize the team responsibility for you know, the quality of the features that they develop. Uh, and, and so I'll, I'll go into just how we do this in sprints. So a sprint for super friends lasts two weeks. Or well, I'm, I'm going to go through, so you, you should have a good idea. A sprint, it lasts for uh, two weeks or 10 working days for Team Super Friends. And for each day, we have uh, five working hours. Uh, so for those seven members, you know, you have 50, 50 hours of work to commit to. So the work that we plan in these sprints, uh, it comes from the Eve product backlog, as I've mentioned. And this has been created by the team uh, from the features that they themselves want to work on. Uh, the product backlog contains something called user stories. And uh, those stories have been prioritized by the team of what they want to work on most, uh, and also just how complex and how long they are to develop. So we begin the cycle of re release, uh, and we roughly plan out the sprint so we know exactly when features uh, are going to come you know, into a state of completion. Uh, we also like reevaluate this plan uh, at the start of every uh, sprint. So there's a, a sprint planning uh, session there. So every two weeks, we look at the plan again for our, our next two weeks, and we decide, OK, uh, we're still on track. You know, we, all of this stuff we set out to th say we were going to do, we're still going to do. And we review our progress daily. Uh, it's called a daily scrum meeting or stand-up in the, the right box there. And we keep track of our progress in, uh, in this daily stand-up. And we look at the sprint. We look at how on track we are of completing things uh, and just how much work we still have uh, committed that we're going to do. And so for Super Friends, this is the entire focus. This is, this is what we do in an EVE development team. Uh, and and this, is, this is the concept of a sprint for us. So we do have a few special sprints. Uh, we have one called a hardening sprint, where there's no committed work. So we're not committing to doing features or anything new. It's just solely for whatever we're doing for the, the release. We polish it up. We fix all of the existing defects that we know about. Uh, and we react to feedback such as, you know, uh, such as uh, polishing or, or, or um, like design choices that players have told us about. We also have a uh, release sprint, uh, and this is for monitoring a release. So directly after we release, uh, we still have no committed work to do. We just want to see exactly what the players are saying they need from a release uh, and what kind of uh, defects that come out of the release. So going into our sprints a bit further, before whole team quality started, our sprint kind of looked like this. So we had stories in a sprint, which are then broken down into several, several tasks. We have the design uh, stage, the implementation stage, and the test stage. And for these tasks, we were developing much like Waterfall. And for those that don't know what that means, we were confusing our development uh, methodology with Waterfall and Agile. And they're two very different beasts and, and trying to do uh, something called waterfall development within Agile was just not working out. But what, what is actually the problem here before whole team quality? I mean, we've been doing it for a while, so why change? Well, the problem here is in the test part. And so it's, it goes, so if I explain what happens, uh, when an issue is found in test, it will go back up to the design or implementation stages. And so not only does it cause this work to go back, uh, the original uh, estimation of you know, complexity or hours that was on this, it gets invalidated. Because 
it gets in <laughs> sorry it gets invalidated because of you know the unestimated hours of work that comes into this and it interrupts them from working on the next thing that they were actually wanting to work on and it just wasn't agile it's it you know we set out to do this for eve development yet this kind of th stuff was still going on so after whole team quality it started to look a little bit more like this and we were implementing uh, the test processes in each task and we were doing it iteratively uh, with whole team quality everybody was aware that they might have to test something so they might have to test a story that they've just been working on or somebody else was working on in the team and from then they became a bit more interested in how they need to test this they started asking questions such as how can we test it when can we test it and what kind of tools do we need to test it and this actually led us into developing similar to test driven developments in superfriends and once we became aware of that we started to build upon it so testing began immediately from day one on design or implementation stages and we did this iteratively we would validate uh, what kind of designs that were coming in from the designers and for Im implementing the sorry we started a new clean approach to unit testing and uh, we also started pair programming and it wasn't just pair programming for the larger more complex systems in eve anymore it was just about you know the smaller things and so after this we saw our progress go more back to agile and away from waterfall so so hopefully now you know a bit more about how we work in sprints. I'm going to go back a few stages and show you how we actually create them. So as I said previously, we work in Scrum in, in Agile. Uh, there is no crunch in Scrum or overtime uh, because what we commit to working, uh, that's, that's the commitment. We have 50 hours to say we're going to do this work within 50 hours. You know, no more is planned and no less. So we plan our sprints through the product backlog. And this is actually a snippet here from uh, the real backlog. Uh, this is for, obviously, the summer industry. Uh, and this is the, uh, the worker selection from Superfriends. So before whole team quality, planning out a sprint meant we would pull stories in and test them out. So we would look at exactly what needs to get done in those stories. The Two stories here are, as a player, those are what we call a user story. Uh, and we would begin to see just how allocated somebody was to a story uh, through tasking, tasking them out. And with over-allocated team members, uh, we often move the, those particular stories which cause the over-allocation to the next sprint. But there was a problem. So the QA member was often over allocated and you know it wasn't just because it was a it was a QA task or it was a test task and you know it's that's just it. it it was just often because the estimations were quite inaccurate and it comes back to what I said about the sprints where we used to have the test phase and it would go back to the designer implementation and the like initial estimation of our hours was just kind of off from what it used to be. So it further invalidated that original estimation of time that the team members themselves gave because it just wasn't consistent you know, between releases. And we just couldn't release good quality features with this. So after whole team quality, the approach to planning changed a bit. And this, uh, this snippet here, this is actually from a sprint. So this is our last sprint, actually. This is Easter for Superfriends. So whole team quality was, was new. And every story that we planned out, uh, it was met with the, you know, the mentality of how are we going to test this and when and who's going to test this. And more often than not, it's usually myself as QA. Um, whole team quality is when everyone can uh, test uh, and should test when needed. It's, it's not just all the time. Uh, it's scalable. 
but whole team quality is also about the awareness of the quality of the products that the team is working itself on. And so our planning began to change for the better. Everybody was more aware. So yes, we, we stopped our little waterfall development within Agile, and it began to result in new tasks being created, accommodating uh, those. Uh, so what's coming out of this is the, you can see like add slash command for deleting items here. So what comes out of this is just uh, more testing tools when it's needed. You know, somebody who was not familiar with uh, how the game works needed to, you know, shortcuts to get into uh, being able to verify these things as working. So now you know a bit more about, uh, hopefully, about some sprints and some planning. I'm just going to go into uh, defects and bugs. So this, uh, this is from our old system, our old defect tracking system. And uh, it's, I think uh, it would have stopped in August 2013. And uh, these are, I just replaced names with users here. So before whole team quality, defects were assigned to individuals to, and to prioritize what they need to fix. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy. It wasn't uh, something that you know, just one person could really do. It was hard for uh, an individual team member to find something that they desperately need to fix. And just the burden of, having, of knowing that you've got this number hanging over you, at, you know, all the time, uh, is is not is not great, and it's it's not something that uh, should sh we should we had. It's not something that we could continue with. We we saw a need for improvement, and still, while this was uh, going on, QA had to monitor the input and output of defects uh, throughout all of their team members, even though the. In each individual team member was assigned uh, a set number of defects. And with regular sprint work going on, this was another significant part of the QA bottleneck. But what we ended up doing was looking towards Scrum. Uh, we just started that, and we, you know, we just started whole team quality pretty well. And it was really starting to work out for us. Uh, and to think of uh, a defect or a bug report as just another uh, sprint story or, or task, it, it started to make a bit more sense. So this is an image from our current bug reports and defect tracking system. You might recognize it as Jira. Uh, what we have here is uh, the team sort of assigned list, the team bucket list. It's no more individuals. Uh, all of the buckets, all, sorry, all of the defects uh, get uh, triaged and by, uh, by Dave, by the Q, uh, QA senior, uh, and all team members of QA. Also, uh, the developers are looking at this list, uh, and they bring it on to the team bucket list. And when we start our sprints, at uh, the same time we start uh, tasking out and planning our stories, uh, we look at how, how many defects we can take from other bucket and what, what kind of things that we can fix. And this goes into the, the, the sprint defects for superends. This is committed like work. This is the same as do saying we need to do features, and this is the same for defects. So when we say we're going to commit to working on a defect, we do. So it, it also excludes the defects that the team themselves create during development. Those automatically go straight onto the sprint defects, and they'll get finished with all of the feature work. And just a few final words on bugs and defects. So now that you can see that we plan for defects, uh, you can also see that you can also see that we sorry we plan for defects, uh, and y you know we also have the hardening sprints and release sprints when we when we exclusively look at those lists, uh, and we also have measurement tools find out how much of a pain it is for you users. Uh, we also recognize this pain, but uh, you know, it, we don't always get it right. And some of you will be asking, 
you know, why haven't you fixed uh, this defect that I reported over a year ago? And what we really need is, is more help with uh, triaging this work. It's, you know, create more bug reports. If you created something over three months ago and it's still in the game and you're still annoyed by it, just keep, keep talking to us about on the forums, submit bug reports. It's the only way we're going to know about how painful it is to you as a user is if you report them to us. So I'm going to dive a bit into sort of before whole team quality and after and just how, how well it worked out. Did it work out? So before we implemented whole team quality, there, there are some things that we needed to change. So we knew we had a QA bottleneck. And you know teams were always waiting for this testing to come in uh, and get done by QA for the features that they've just uh, worked on. We also had long reaction times to bug reports. Well, so long times from what we now consider long. We were also quite uh, restrictive on deployments. I don't know how old many of you guys are, but we used to run final tests on tranquility on the day of deployment. And this VIP time was often quite, quite large. You know, it could be anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 to beyond that. And because of this, you know, only QA really knew the status of a build. Only QA knew how volatile or stable it is or how risky it was to deploy. We were, we were open in communicating this uh, to, you know, those who needed to know, you know, the, the live uh, producer or so on. But still, only QA really knew. And the development teams themselves never really had a clear picture of this. Oh, sorry. And one last thing. There was still some things that needed to be manually tested. Uh, we hadn't fully utilized uh, our QA engineers. And there was a slight disconnect between those QA engineers and those. Uh, they were working for QA, but they were also working for Eve development, trying to give tools between the two with no kind of clear product owner of, yes, you should serve these guys or you should serve these. So after whole team quality, this is you know this is the kind of meats of the presentation. What I'm the point I'm trying to get. Uh, what's the story? What did we see? Well, the QA bottleneck is 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 gone in a sense. We now have scalable QA with the rest of development, uh, and if the development velocity increases, we we do have the bandwidth to accommodate that. We also have a uh, great awareness. So. Not only that uh, the teams were looking at, but we just had more people looking at the product than ever before. Uh, we, they were finding out the health of the actual game uh, from the, you know, the client itself to uh, the health of our services or infrastructure, such as the API. Uh, and because of this, people were finding things that they could fix right there on the spot. Artists finding issues. Uh, Engineers finding problems that they just, you know, takes two seconds. They can go, all right, I know what this is. I'm going to fix this. And it also encouraged other uh, disciplines to accommodate for quality. So they had to look at their own processes for design. Uh, you know, they, they had to look at. Uh <laughs> Sorry. OK. So it, it encouraged uh, other disciplines to look to the processes. For example, for design, uh, they looked at uh, creating uh, something called uh, user journeys. And, and for engineers, uh, it was on the unit test side. And uh, not only that, but uh, QA tools was something that was also being created. And it was created by EVE development. It was no longer. Uh, this strange team, it was created by Eve Development, uh, by the engineers on the team that needed those kinds of tools. And uh, it, it stopped this confusing situation for our QA engineers. There are some side effects that we didn't fully uh, anticipate, uh, side effects which were pretty beneficial for us. And in Team Super Friends, uh, the engineers, as I, I began to say, they they started to uh, adopt test-driven development uh, in order to 
help with the features that we, we made. Uh, and it really started to kick off around Odyssey and beyond. More, sp more specifically, uh, they started practicing extreme programming, where appropriate. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, full details on this, but I'll quickly list some of the benefits for us. So we just had more testing, and it's, it's that simple. We had acceptance testing going on, and we had unit testing. We had a solid foundation of uh, building unit tests. And some of you developers might have your own opinion about this, Erlenda. And uh, you know, for, for super friends, it was a, it was a big win for us. Uh, and it, it was just another healthy, healthy layer on the, uh, the whole testing as a, as a general. It was a healthy addition on the layer of testing. So design was also, as I said, looking to further validate their designs. And they, they started uh, user journey mapping. They started looking towards the team itself. So in this case, Team Super Friends. And they started to look a bit out more to Eve development. Uh, and you know, uh, I, I probably should explain what user journey mapping is. It's, it's basically going through the, the experience of uh, a feature as a user finding out what they, uh, they feel while doing this, finding out what kind of things they need. Uh, and also for the uh, user experience testing, uh, it was just basically looking at uh, how usable it is with a very different degree of uh, players. We had uh, complete noobs and also very experienced players, but in certain areas of the game. And we, we watched them live through a webcam and just wanted to see how they interacted with the features that we developed for them. So all in all, Team Super Friends does you know, a lot more testing than ever before. And before whole team quality, none of this was really possible. We, um, yeah, I, I mean, I hope that's uh, a bit of an insight into this for you. Uh, and you know, if you've got any more questions, you can ask me uh, just at the end of this. But for now, I'll, I'll switch it back to Dave, and he can talk a bit more. So now you all have a pretty decent knowledge of uh, what comprises a development team, but those teams are missing one member, robots. A vast army of robots. As Paradox touched on, our, uh, our unit testing is getting there. We're getting a kind of like burgeoning, bottom-up, developer-driven approach to unit testing, which is great, and that's exactly how it should be. If it were to come mandated from the top, I don't think it would work nearly as well. Um, in the short to midterm, our strategy is going to be uh, utilizing Crest to kind of um, give us a little bit of system level testing without having to uh, go into the client. Inside the client is very difficult to automate. Server calls much more easily so. And then in the long term, hopefully you've just become self-aware and codes it and tests itself. And uh, yeah, we can't do this alone. Uh, we've got our outsourcers, Pull to Win. They're running regression tests every every two weeks. Uh, they provide us with a lot of focus testing, and uh, they're really their work is just invaluable to us. Um, we have obviously the CSM who will uh, you know assist us with triaging issues or getting in touch with player groups that um, you know like can can really divert uh, sorry direct us to the defects that are important to you guys. Um, and then there's you guys. You submit. On average, 475 bug reports per month. That's uh, that's low. I'm pretty sure it's per week. I'm just going to check my notes. No, it's per month, right on. And uh, as well as you know, uh, using your spare time to come and help us out on CC, uh, you know, doing mass tests and just general like ad hoc testing of our new features. That's that's laudable. And uh, finally, of course, our ISD division, EK, the bug hunters. Um, they they really are the the oil that makes the engine run. They help us process over 75% of bug reports each release cycle, uh, as well as supporting us in mass tests and, and just general like CC maintenance. Uh, so thank you to ISD. And they're recruiting. So uh, if you have uh, any interest in, in joining ISD, you grab either of us, any of these QA guys down the front, or any of the ISD guys. There's quite a few of them floating around. And they'll give you some pointers on, um, on how to get involved. Uh, and so that's that's pretty much it for us. Uh, we have the QA roundtable tomorrow at two o'clock uh, in in roundtable room two. Hope uh, to see some of you there. We have 
a little bit of time to take some questions now, if you have any. And uh, there's our Twitter handles if you want to keep in touch outside of FanFest. But um, yeah, apart from that, just thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> so questions? questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So we should probably repeat the questions. For yeah, you. okay. It's uh, The question was, so we, we're doing pair programming now. Where do we find it useful and where don't we find it useful? Um, so I've actually, two of my programmers are right in the audience. Uh, you know, I, I could speak for them, but maybe they want to answer this. They don't have mics. We have a <laughs> mic here. I don't know if it works. Uh, okay, so <laughs> to be honest, it's... So when I, I, I briefly mentioned about uh, it wasn't just the large complex systems in EVE anymore. Uh, and the way this is, is that we're doing, sm like, sm we're kind of doing smaller, uh, we're not trying to design these huge complex systems within EVE that we can no longer maintain. They're all in something called packages and, you know, how we, how we do Python. Uh, and this is something which really helps us just uh, work on uh, sort of isolate uh, a kind of development of a feature. And I think in pair programming, it, it works best. Correct me if I'm wrong, Marcus. <laughs> but it, it works best for them when, you know, we begin the whole, when we begin looking at this user story uh, and finding out from design, you know, what's needed, where, where are we going to look? And, and they kind of all sit down together and uh, drawn paper and, fi and figured this out and uh, yeah I, I think so I th I'm trying to, th to I'm trying to counter this with a bad example of pair program but after whole team quality I'm not sure there was before probably yes uh, it, I mean we can use the analogy as too many cooks spoil the broth um, but since after uh, uh, I s just watching my team I haven't really experienced the bad side of this Marcus? No? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is okay. No. No? You can talk directly into Scott's face. <laughs> uh, he, he's got a loud voice, so he can. Hope that answers your question. Anyone else? Yep. Uh, I'll take one in the back. <laughs> so at four o'clock, there is a uh, <laughs> the producer roundtable. Uh, those guys will answer it. But it, it's a. Uh, you know, it, it, it sounds crazy. For instance, uh, the, there's two teams working on industry as an example, and Game of Thrones uh, is working in one-week sprints. Team Two Friends works in two-week sprints. However, we still have the same Scrum Master uh, for those teams, and the product owners of those teams uh, have a very good awareness of exactly, you know, when we committed all of these stories and when we said certain features were going to come in. Uh, and it, it's... You know, it's just all about oversight and, and communicating this of when, and when uh, you know, we have a, a sprint review at the end of every sprint with our stakeholders. You know, we tell them the progress. These sprint reviews are recorded and they're available for everybody to watch so you can find out the progress of a team. Uh, for production, it's, it's, you know, at the end of these sprints, they it's easy for them to see uh, if, you know, things are starting to look a bit shaky, uh, especially the Scrum Master who is you know, who preaches Scrum on all of these teams, he's much more of aware of the progress, more so than the team is aware of it themselves. So hopefully that answers it a little bit, but okay.
How do we organize? It's, so this is what whole team quality is. It's, it's signed off by the team. So the team signs off. The team is responsible for saying the quality of the features that we've just developed, we're happy with, we're ready to go out. And so because of that, it's everybody in Eve development. We all now know the like, actual stages and the actual quality of uh, the features that we've just developed. It's no longer just the QA who have to then try and coordinate between each other. Oh, how is your team looking? Are you, are you on track for this? No, it's, it's now the entire. And the stakeholders know this, the senior producer, producers, scrum master, product owners. Y you know, we, we are really aware of how we are looking. So maybe that answer is a little bit more. Okay. A decent analogy for how we're trying to handle uh, deployments and releases right now is if you imagine a series of trains and they all have a scheduled time that they're going to leave the station. When they leave the station, they have a six-week journey time before they hit TQ. Um, so teams work in sandboxes outside of the train and put their sandboxes onto the train, which is effectively just like the main line of code. And for the Brits amongst you, this is not British rail, so yeah. it's, it's almost German to Japanese. So <laughs> it, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, effectively, the the team chooses to go on the train that fits the the quality state mm -hmm. of their feature at the time, if that makes sense. There's another question over there. Like, like the team composition of... Uh, I mean, this started uh, a long time ago with QA. Uh, they were on a team, but before whole team quality, th this concept, we, we, was, we were just on the team, but we were working more as a department for you know, managing the quality and on that kind of oversight. Uh, we, still, we were still committed on the sprints of doing testing, but like I said, we're always over-allocated. More or less, we, we had to call in other people to help out. Uh, but now, I mean, it's, it's always going to be like this in CCP, just like QA is uh, another development member. Uh, we're just on the team working there. Uh, we just help them like, realize this, uh, the team is responsible for the quality of the features that they do. So hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That sounds fantastic for me. I mean, yeah, it's so. I mean, we we do ship out onto Singularity on a test service, and we we do release these uh, in the forums. Uh, you know, these kind of feature, and we want you to give us feedback. But you know, this is only in text form. Uh, and it's generally feedback on a feature. Um, usability testing, this kind of remote usability testing, uh, we're able to see their face uh, while they're doing this. We're doing this live. So when somebody gets to something frustrating, they may not say anything. Uh, as many of us, we might not make a bug report or we might not talk about it. But when they make a really grumpy face, we know something was wrong here. And we're watching the client at the same time. And we say, OK, he's trying to do this action, but it's not working out. We, we need to fix this. And make sure that you know he's not grumpy face, but he's actually happy interacting with our features. But you know, if <laughs> if, if if players want to you know submit submit this kind of stuff, this the, you know that's kind of exciting, especially as, especially with you know with Twitch streaming. You know, lots of people have webcam setups already, and if if they want to record something for us to say, okay, I I use your feature here. It is on you know on YouTube or Twitch. Is that something I, I kind of would like to hear more about? I mean, we have seen players do that before. Uh, well, they're, they're, they, they tend not to record their, their face <laughs> while playing, but um, they will like do a full on, OK, I'm going to try this feature out on CC and record it for YouTube, put it off on YouTube, and then send it to us. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been pretty helpful. The face makes it much more helpful. Paradox is right. Because like, cause like I said, some, sometimes you don't say something. For instance, if, if it's really obvious bug and, and you've came across it and you're like, I'm sure everybody else has reported this, because how could they miss it? I'm, I'm not going to say anything. And we come across that a lot. And it's like, no, no, just report everything, tell us everything. You know, we, we don't mind that at all. 
It's uh, we just want to get you know the quality features out before uh, out quick enough, and we don't want to have to keep like like this kind of uh, stage of oh okay we've seen this issue we're going to come back to it or something like this we want we want feedback sooner in like as just report it report feedback this yeah. that's kind of my point tell us what's wrong all the time yep Thanks. go we have time for one more so this will be the last one okay So okay. right now, um, obviously, a lot of you will be aware that the two-way communication part of uh, bug reporting isn't in place with our new system. Um, this is going to require some development time, and we don't have it mapped out. So like, I, I can't like give you a date when it's going to come. But when that does come in, then it's, I mean, getting fully clued into the journey from your bug report to defect creation to that defect being fixed, that becomes a little complex. But we can certainly. Uh, we can certainly look into it as, as, as an extra way of keeping you updated. One yeah. of the great things about Jira above our uh, old system is that obviously it has a very robust API. And uh, yeah, that, that could be something we could achieve. I mean, I, I understand the frustration of, of getting that feedback of, yes, it is a duplicate and we know about it. But uh, you know, knowing when the resolution comes for that, you know, maybe it's, it's not impossible. I'd say that it's not impossible. That's harder. Yeah. Sure. I actually have uh, some yeah. like kind of wild fantasies about having a section of our defect tracking be public, but I'll be going over that a little more in the roundtable tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but finding absolutely. out th when that duplicate gets fixed is, I think, the part which is kind of frustrating. Cause <laughs> okay, so I'm afraid uh, that's us out of time, but thank you all so much for coming. Really appreciate it. <laughs>